Today's video is brought to you by StoryboardThat.com. Please visit TeacherCast.net slash StoryboardThat for a limited time offer. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tech Educator Podcast. You are listening to the best weekly webinar featuring the world's best weekly educators. This is episode 73. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. There's, of course, several ways that you can connect with us. You can, of course, check us out on our website, techeducatorpodcast.com. You can follow us on Twitter, at Tech Ed Show, and all of our archives can be found up online at teachercast dot net slash itunes and teachercast.net slash youtube my name is jeff bradbury and tonight we're going to be talking all about digital curation tools for your classroom we have a huge panel tonight and before we get into our topic tonight i want to bring on our guest mr sam patterson sam how are you today how are things out in california things in california are amazing having a great time out here been writing pretty much most of the day so i'm feeling pretty good about that excellent uh, what what are you writing these days I'm um, writing a lot about code and how to teach with it, getting ready for the Hour of Code. We've got an Hour of Code family day on my campus. And just to let you know, on Friday, there's going to be a post on Edutopia all about how to create your own Hour of Code family day at your school. That is pretty, pretty cool. So thank you so much for being here today. And uh, I believe you also have another coder next to you. Is, is Walker available? Yes, he is. He's currently uh, pretty busy because he's making his own app. But let's see if we can get him up here. Walker, you're making your own app? Oh, yeah. It's a, it's a puppet app specifically for puppets by puppets. For, for, wow. And, and what's the app going to do? Uh, I'm not exactly sure, but you won't need a hand to use it. It's all voice controlled. I will take that pun, and I'm going to introduce our next host, <laughs> Mr. Jeff Herb. How are you today? I'm doing great, Jeff. Good to see you. How are you? It is doing well here. Uh, we've got some great things going on in Babyland. How is Babyland for you? Going great. Yeah, we've had a really good day just kind of hanging around and enjoying some time. So, yeah, nice. it's been a good day. Have you come to the realization that your child currently is unemployed or unemployable? <laughs> I'm having I'm having an issue with this. <laughs> well, and why do you say? I, I, I just I, I just realized the other day I have three freeloaders. <laughs> Yeah, you got to watch out for that. How are things going at the Instructional Tech Talk? Things are going great, Jeff. Yeah, we've had a good couple weeks, and we're um, putting together some good shows. We did a show this past week. Sam Patterson was on the show again. Really? We were talking about, yeah, we were talking about Sphero wow. and um, the use of connected toys in education. So that was a really cool discussion. That's That'll pretty cool. This week. Yeah, it'll be out this week. And so I want to also bring on to the show from the House of Ed Tech and my partner in crime this week at the NJEA convention, Mr. Chris Nessie. Chris, how are you? I'm doing good since the last time I actually physically saw you, which was just a couple of days ago. We had a great time. Of course, this weekend was the NJEA, New Jersey Educators Association Conference, and we had the TeacherCast booth out there live, and uh, we put together a special edition of the Tech Educator Podcast, which is going to be coming out sometime this week. Chris, what did you think of the uh, what did you think of the convention? I thought the convention was very well put together, um, but honestly, my favorite part was the opportunity to actually sit next to you and actually do a live broadcast. That was really fun. And I do thank you again for inviting me to do that with you. It is always fun to get there, and it's, it's even more fun when people come up and start asking questions. We, of course, have uh, a few videos up online already over at teachercast.net slash YouTube. We made some friends with a great New Jersey company called Black Rocket, which was there at the convention putting together video games. And essentially, they were taking green screen images of people, and they were putting them immediately into their own side-scrolling video game which is really, really neat. And we're going to try to get them on the show at some point. Then we also did one with Entourage Yearbooks, and we also did one with Project Foundry, which is all about uh, 
you know, project based learning. So we're going to be ha having all those posts come out this week on teachercast.net. And if you want to check out those videos, they're over on teachercast.net slash YouTube. Josh, how are you today? Doing well, doing well. Thanks for asking. Getting prepared for a little bit of snow this week. Thankfully, we don't live about 50 miles northwest of here. Well, as we get like a foot. Nor wait, <laughs> north northwest? Are we are we talking Kanye here? What are we? What what? <laughs> nice. Um, no, northwest of Green Bay. Oh, part of Wisconsin, the Arctic Circle, as I like to call it. Right. Uh, we are getting into that yeah. point of view. Have they um have they asked for Brett Favre to come back yet? How how are things out there? I think things are well. I think most people more are more upset at our coach. Or, <laughs> sorry, at the Green Bay's coach. I shouldn't say our. They're not my my favorite team, so to speak. But nice. Yeah, so today we're talking right. we're talking all about digital curation tools, and this is something that is for every educator out there, no matter how you know what whatever how how old they are, whatever grade levels they teach. This concept of digital curation is is important. So tonight we're going to be talking about things like Live Binders and WordPress and and Evernote, and all these different things, ways to con uh, ways to curate your digital content. Jeff, let me bring you in here and ask why is it important to have a secure or a system for curating the web? Uh, I think it's really important because there is just so much information out there. And I know personally when I'm working through tw Twitter, I'm going to use Twitter as an example. Um, you know, when you're going through Twitter and your feed is just expanding like crazy, you have no idea how to control it. Being able to curate that information and being able to uh, store your most favorite pieces, um, you know, in one spot, I think is the most important. So just b having a way to manage it all. Managing is certainly interesting. Let's take a step even farther than that. And by the way, if you are out there watching us live on TeacherCast.tv and you have questions about digital curation or any of the tools we're going to be have coming up with, please uh, take advantage of the chat box. We have a live show right now. I want to give a big plug to uh, Peggy and Alyssa and Jana and uh, Josh. Um, Sam, let me bring you in here. When we're talking about curation, what does that mean to you? So when we're curating something, like oftentimes you only hear curating talked about in terms of like a museum or it's someone who selected the things that are going to be in a museum's collection. But when teachers are curating resources, they're trying to organize things they've found in a way that is accessible, searchable, and shareable. So I may find a billion great resources on Twitter in a day, but if I don't have a way of actually getting back to them, its utility is going to be limited because I'll say, oh, I remember there was this one thing that somebody posted about something that looked cool, and then that's not going to make it into my classroom. But if I can take that information and put it somewhere where I can search for programming tool, and then all of the programming tools come up, that's going to be useful to me and it makes it easy for me to share it with someone else so when they say help I need a good programming tool for Chromebooks for first graders I can say yes I can find that for you here's a link well curating it is one thing I mean taking the World Wide Web and saying I want this and I want this and I want this that is curating at level one but then the next level down I think is curating what you've curated and keeping things organized. Josh, you're going to talk to us a little bit today about bookmarking. Why is it important just to start by bookmarking your your uh, frequently used websites? Well, I think it's all about saving time, even if it's seconds, uh, because we do things, at least in Wisconsin, I think our, we have like 180 instructional days. So if there's something that you're using 180 times, Saving seconds a day is going to add up to minutes and potentially hours. And even just something as simple as bookmarking sites that you commonly use that you can get back to really quick without having to search for or type in, I mean, that's invaluable amount of time. Are we talking about just curating for ourselves or are we talking about curating for others? Chris, why is it important that we not only curate for our own uses but so that others can use them as well? Repeat the question again. I'm sorry. Well, like we're talking about bookmarks and bookmarks, for, for instance, seems very, very personal. Like I, these are the bookmarks that I'm using. But in other cases, like we're going to talk about live binders shortly, people use a live binder to curate the web for themselves. 
but then they also have the ability to share that resource out. Why is it important that we're curating not only for ourselves but for others? Well, because simply we may find something that somebody else did not find yet, and if other people are finding the same things, I think that validates the value of said resource. Excellent. So we're going to take a look at resources today that are not only invaluable resources for our own curation, but also have a shareable thing. And we're going to take some of these resources that we've talked about before, like WordPress, If This Then That, and really share with you not only how it's able to be stored personally, but again, shared with the web here. Sam, you are going to talk to us a little bit first here about live binders. Um, TeacherCast is certainly not a stranger of live binders. In fact, if you are over at TeacherCast.net, you will notice that uh, under the media tab here, we have uh, what I always call the second largest collection of live binders in the world. And I think last time I checked, we have over like 200,000 live binders. And they're all kind of done here by category. Here's one for administrators, school educators, technology. There's a lot of different things here that we can use this on. Um, what are live binders, Sam, and why are we using them for curation? Live binders is an amazing site. And when I first started working with digital resources online, it was one of the first sites that I integrated into my daily use. I just put up on screen Peggy George's live binders collection, and she is a champion live binders compiler. So what we will see here in live binders, we can go to like one of her classroom 2.0 live live binders or her RS con live binder we'll go to classroom 2.0 live February 2014 and what we can see when this opens is we've got all of these great tags hey there's Felix he was the guy who put together Miami device and we see we've got all of these great sites in a visual way that make them easy to access we've got a tab here for SAMR and we can go there we can see this links to a specific site and we click on that, and it's going to take us to a Tech Chef for You site about SAMR. Um, we can have all of these resources not only at our disposal, but displayed right here in the browser. And LiveBinders really specializes in collecting a lot of resources in one place and making it so you can share those resources easily by either sending someone a direct link to that entire binder of resources. So you take maybe 100, 150 links and bring them down to one link that you can actually comment on and annotate. Or you can even create an embeddable binder that you can put on your website so that your user on your website can click through to those resources without actually leaving your site. So, and, and like I said, it's not only a link to the resource itself, but you have the opportunity to annotate that link and provide some contextual information about what you find most usable on that website. And I believe with live binders, you also have the opportunity to present from them too. You do. I haven't done that as much. Let's see if I can find the, is there a present button on here? Put me on the spot here, Jeff. Do you know how that works? Wait, um, there we go, present. So if I click the present mode, then it's going to give it to me in a way that kind of takes some of the visual uh, noise out of it and makes it a little bit more at like a presentation. Several of these uh, curation tools have present modes on them. I think later on we're going to see that Evernote also has a present mode. So it's something that we've come to expect from our curation tools that we can actually use them to share information directly and it's in just as visual a format as actually accessing it directly on the web. You know, one of the neat things here about Live Binders, and you're going to find this with a lot of these curation tools, is not only is it personal, not only is it something where you can share it with others, but you can easily embed it onto a website. Sam, would you be able to share with us how you can embed a Live Binder onto a website or? Sure. If I want to embed this Live Binder on a website, I'm just going to. Let's see, get back to the controls here. Let me share this again. So on the live binder here, you have your share link here. If I click link or embed, I get 
a link to the current tab, a link to the binder itself, or I can click more embed options. There's a, pre, a present link, and there's two embeds down here. There's an embed uh, binder icon or embed the open binder. I always like going with embedding the open binder because that allows me to have this entire visual feast right there in the middle of my website. That's pretty important there that that's there. And a lot of people don't realize that that's easy to put that there. I mean, as far as looking at class websites and stuff, to create a chapter-by-chapter -chapter resource, it's pretty important. That way you send your kids to a safe location, your class website, and they have access to all of these things. Jeff, you know, I know you're going to talk a little bit about Evernote and some other ways that you can embed stuff, but... If you just take live binders, why would it be important for a school or a school administration to create a live binder around something such as parent contacts or college admission or any of these topics? Why would a school want to do all that stuff? Well, I think it's a really good opportunity for the school to be able to kind of vet information and be able to put a set of you know, content available for parents that may not have the time nor the knowledge to work through a ton of information and say, yes, this is relevant, no, this isn't. Um, I think by using something like Live Binders, you can have a set of 15, 20, 100 resources that are relevant to what parents are, or students are looking for all in one stop. So I think that it's more of a convenience thing and then one of um, information authority. You know that you know if you're sharing it with your parents, they know that it's something that can be trusted because it's been vetted by the school. Josh, you do something a little bit different for your um, curation. You're using Google Bookmarks. Talk to us a little bit about what Google has offered, uh, is offering us in the form of cu uh, curation. Sure. Now, if you're used to bookmarking, then there's really nothing different. Uh, there's the little star on the address bar you can click on to bookmark, or you can use Control-D as a keyboard shortcut. And let me go ahead and share my screen. Here we go. All right. So on a Chrome screen, you know, if you have the bookmarks bar open, you know, you can have all your bookmarks here, and then you can have individual folders they go into. Then if you go into the bookmarks manager where I'm sitting right now, you just get this kind of list, ugly looking list of the sites that are there, uh, and it's been pretty boring for the most part. It's just your typical bookmarks situation, but they're changing that. They've actually added an extension now that turns your bookmarks from this into this. So it looks a lot cleaner. Can everybody see that? Neat. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it looks a lot cleaner and more visually pleasing. It actually adds this picture uh, description to it. So instead of just having this link, you have a picture description. And on the resource itself, oops, I went there. Uh, on the resource itself, you've got a title and some information on there. Um, so it's it's a nice, it's a better glance, but uh, the cool part with this is that when you search your bookmarks, it doesn't just search the titles. It searches the sites as well. So it's allowing you to use the power of Google search within your own bookmarks. Um, in addition to some of the bookmarks that you create, the folders, they actually also do some auto folders based on some of the more popular things that you make or that you bookmark. So it automatically curates certain things into folders on its own. So I really like it. I think it needs some polish. I think it's still very new for the most part. In fact, it's so new. Uh, there's this article I found, and it'll get shared in the chat in a second here. Uh, that I got it from. And it was a different article than this, but omgchrome.com is a pretty good source too. There's a link to the bookmark manager extension. When I go to the Chrome Web Store, I can't find it in there when I search for it. Uh, so I'm not sure if it's not quite live yet or not, uh, but we'll get the link out there if you want to check it out. Um, I think it's really neat. The one thing I can't get to work yet, and I don't know if it's just me or if it's just not quite ready, is that you actually can share your folders so if I go to one of my folders, let's choose this one. At the top, you actually have a little folder that says whether it's private or public, and then an option to share the folder. Now currently mine are grayed out, and 
I've been looking at this for about a half an hour and couldn't find anywhere that I could toggle it. Um, it says the parent folder is not publicly shareable, so it's probably just my organization that I need to use. Uh, might be because all my stuff is stuffed into the bookmarks bar. So I'll have to curate my own stuff a little better. But you'll be able to actually share your folders of bookmarks with people. So it adds that social element to it as well. Um, and then that's going to be stock right in Chrome if you have that extension. You know, I love the fact here that it's very, very visual. And I think that's a very, very neat thing. So that way, again, it doesn't matter if you're doing it with elementary kids or high school kids or even for your own use. Um, that, that visual element is really, really neat. And, and I, it, it's really cool that Google's doing it that way these days. Absolutely. want to showcase with you something new. Um, that it's Well, it's not really new, but people don't really know it's there, and that's WordPress. And we've talked a lot about WordPress over the years, but did you realize that WordPress can be used as a digital curation tool? I want to bring up here a simple WordPress site, and this is a blank WordPress site. And quite oftentimes you might want to you know, write a blog post and keep things, but sometimes you might want to use WordPress to curate other articles that you find. And it's really, really easy to do that. If I'm logged into my WordPress site and I come over here to the dashboard, all I have to do is come down here to settings and then writing. And what writing does is it gives you this tool called Press This. And this is a little bookmarklet app that allows you to grab pieces of the web and embed them right into your blog. And all I'm going to do is click on here and I'm going to drag this, say, up to my toolbar. And we're going to just put this here. Do I want to add the bookmark? Yes. So I've got this press this here, and this is pressing anything that I find onto this website. I'm going to come up here to my second favorite website altogether, and that's called My Paperless Classroom, where I have this little ball here. And I'd like to press this ball against my website. And so what I'm going to do is <laughs> I'm going to hit press this, and I'm going to click on this. And immediately you're going to notice here that it comes up with a second dialogue. And I can rename this. So I'm going to call this My Paperless Classroom and I will call it Dance Robot Dance. And if I want to, I can certainly take this and I can write some other things to it. I can, of course, change the category and I can I can make it look like a WordPress thing and I can do all these different things to it that are WordPressy. And then as soon as I hit publish, it says my post is now published. So I'm going to come over here to my website. And let me pull this back up. And when I come over here and refresh it, I have that post here. And I also have it a link to this post. So there's a lot of different things that you can do there. Now, some of the themes that you're going to find, for instance, I used to have on TeacherCast a uh, Pinterest theme. So the Pinterest theme would actually pull in the featured image and a whole bunch of text from it. And you can do a lot of different things, but that is the press this feature in WordPress. Jeff, do you use that feature at all, or did you know about that feature? I I knew it was there. I didn't quite know what it did necessarily, so naturally I can say that I do not use it. It's but a, it looks pretty cool. It's I a neat little feature. I mean, you know, we're all out yeah. trying to find great tools and blogging about them. So, for instance, if I did see something on Instructional Tech Talk, I can press that that website and then I could write a quick paragraph or two about it, and I already have all the links in there. It's 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 not one that's heavily used, but it works out pretty well. Yeah, that's neat. I like it. Going from paperless classroom and pressing things to your pocket. Chris, what's in your pocket, and how do you use it? <laughs> well, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the web app called Pocket, which used to be called uh, Read It Later, for those that are familiar with that. So let me get the uh, the screen share up here. But this awesome multi view for you screen is being shared. That'd be fant that'd be fantastic. Did we just lose Chris? I think so. We just lost Chris. Chris is on his way back in a little bit here. Um, let's move on to another one. Sam, you were going to go on to another curation app. 
I was going to talk a little bit about an app that I don't know if we've ever covered here before. Have we talked about Evernote on this show before? I don't think so. <laughs> tell, me, tell me more about this Evernote. This Evernote, it's, um, honestly, it's a well that is so deep. Every time I dip into it, more good things happen. Um, just this week, I figured out on my iPad that I could change from a snippet view to a card view. So instead of seeing a list of what I had saved in Evernote, I could see a visual grid. And I use Evernote every day in my work because I can't keep track of which device I'm on. And sometimes I forget everything except my phone. So if I put everything I'm working on into Evernote, I can always get to it, which is probably like one of the key things for curation for me is instant access especially for things like handouts I'm working on, my work schedule, which actually this year, instead of doing something fancy and technological like entering my work schedule into a calendaring program, I wrote it with colored pencil on a piece of paper and still haven't gotten around to putting it into Google Calendar. So I just keep going back to the PDF that I scanned into Evernote. Um, but by changing it to the card view, it's very easy for me to see where that PDF is, and I can just go straight to that, click on it, and open it up. All of my class lists that tell me which first grader is supposed to be on which iPad, I keep all of those in Evernote because, worst case, even if I forget all of my devices, I can grab one of those first grade devices, sign into the Evernote app, sign into my account, and I've got that information there. And if you're looking for more information about Evernote, you can certainly head over to TeacherCast. We have a great set of online courses for you. This is over under the TC University tab, and then you can click on Evernote, and that pulls up a bunch of Evernote videos, and we're going to be adding more of those as we go throughout the, uh, throughout the semester here. But we have just a bunch and bunch and bunch of great Evernote videos. So if you're looking for tips on that and others, please check us out over there at TeacherCast. Um, Chris, are you back to normal here? Ah, there we go. Let's bring Chris up. Chris, talk to us I about think, Pocket. I think I should be back to normal. So what I'm going to be talking about tonight is Pocket. Again, it used to be called Read It Later. Uh, basically, Pocket is used by over 12 million people to easily save articles, videos, and really anything else that you can throw into it, either on your iOS device or your Android device. It also has browser extensions that you can use to throw things into Pocket. What can you save with Pocket? You can save anything. You can save articles, videos, recipes, or whole web pages that you find online or in your favorite apps. You can save them everywhere. You can view them everywhere, even offline. Uh, so real quick, as I'm sharing the screen here, uh, this is you know an image of Pocket, and you can see it's multi-platform, multi-device, and Basically, when you go into Pocket, it looks similar to what we've already seen with Google Bookmarks and some of the other tools that are out there, but this allows you to also basically save things that you find that are important. Uh, one of the ways that I use it, uh, I am a user of Zite to curate and use a, and read a lot of articles based on my interests, You know, whether it's podcasting or sports or education technology. Uh, I can throw things and articles that I want to read later into my pocket. You also have the ability in pocket to tag articles. So I can go up here to my tag filter. I can look at everything. I can look at untagged items or some of the tags that I have created. Uh, so let's just pick one at random here. Let's say Google Chrome. So this will bring up anything about Google Chrome that I thought was interesting which is right now just one thing. So let me try and bring up something that may be a little uh, more interesting here. Let's try, well, let's try math. I know I've found a few things. All right, so I found two. Um, but basically it's a nice way to save for later. This is one of the tools that I use to curate content for the House of Ed Tech and also on my blog. And even if you're not doing those types of things with technology, it's just a great way to save things that you want to refer back to later or share with other people because you can email and, you know, it's a great tool. And again, I did notice it is very visual there, so it must be very easy to pick up and learn. 
yes, it, it's um, it's it's not difficult. There's not a lot of settings. Uh, as you can see here with the screen still being shared, I can change the view, you know, to a simple list view. And it also has like Evernote or with Google Bookmarks or the Press This from WordPress, there is a Chrome extension where you can basically save to your pocket. So it's pretty cool. Neat. Now, you know, um, yeah. Chris Brent in the chat just said that Pocket now has iOS extension features. Are you familiar with those at all? Yes. In the, I have an iPad Mini, and Pocket, you do have the ability. You can kind of pull it up into your notifications area on iOS. So things that you save, you can kind of get, give yourself push notifications on things that you find important. So that's also a really cool feature. There's just Excellent. a lot of new things happening with that iOS 8. I don't know if you noticed that. Jeff, did you find anything new since we did the show last week on Yosemite that was uh, extension-like or that enhances the uh, Apple experience? I'm trying to remember what – I mean, we went through so much we, last week. I'm we trying did. to remember anything new. I yeah. actually have something I can jump in with if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah, go for it. I saw um, – it's called Neato, N-E-A-T-O. And it is a note-taking app for iOS. And what it allows you to do, it doesn't give you the ability to take notes in an app while you're using iOS. It allows you to take notes in the notification center of your Ooh. iPad or your iPhone or your iPod. So it's actually pretty cool. That would be nice. fun to explore. We have a and live chat going on here. We're, of course, live every single Sunday night at 7 o'clock Eastern here, 4 p.m. Pacific. And we are found on TeacherCast.tv. And I don't know if you guys have been watching the chat room here. Somebody had mentioned something called Symbaloo. Um, does anybody know anything about Symbaloo? Uh, I have used Symbaloo quite a bit in the past. What is Symbaloo? Oh, learned... well, Symbaloo is a bookmarking tool. Wow, shocker. Uh, we've shared a couple of those tonight already. <laughs> um, I actually learned about this uh, the first year I attended Slate a couple years back from Jason Bretzman. I believe he is at jbretzman on Twitter. Um, great proponent of Flip Classroom, actually, was one of the people that got Flipping 2.0, uh, the book, out there and compiling all of these uh, teachers' experiences with flipping. Anyways, that's just his background and how awesome he is. He shared Symbaloo and how much he likes to use it, and I've been a fan of it for since, so let me get right into it. Uh, like I said, Symbaloo is a bookmarking tool, uh, but like that visual side of things that I showed in the Bookmarks Manager for Chrome, it's got that edge. And it also has the shareability that's really nice as well. So, should be shared. We should be looking at my screen right now. Does everybody see that? Yes. I should just trust that it works instead of asking every time. <laughs> um, I'm so I was so burned early in the uh, tech educator run that everything froze that I just want to make sure. So, this is a main Symbaloo screen. I am logged in. I have an account here. Uh, as you can see, I have this grid, and on this grid. I have different sites with different icons on there. Um, so you've got that visual look. In addition, I've got this Google search sitting right in the middle. So you could actually set this up as a home page for your students. And each of these mixes, as they call it, has a website at the top that you can use uh, that when you can share this out, that is a site. So a student can come out here and they have all of these bookmarks organized. Uh, so this one was just ones I put together. I did ones on typing games. Uh, I did this feature called Website Wednesday for a while, so I put that together. Um, did one with student blogs. So I had the student blogs and portfolios on one mix for all the students to get to. Um, and it's really easy to put these together. Once you set this up, um, you can click and add new tile. And depending on what you want to do, it's either pretty quick or you have to do a little bit of editing. Uh, you can search for tiles. So if there's a site that's already been bookmarked somewhere else on Symbaloo, you can search for it, such as, let's say, ESPN.com, and you can grab a pre-made tile to use on this. Or if it's something like student portfolios, which probably won't have been used yet, you can create a tile, and you can customize this, everything from the address of the website to the name you want on the tile and whether or not you want to show the text. And then you can actually choose an image to have as your background. So you can really, really make it nice and visual. And then when you're ready, and, you, and this is something that you'd like to share, up at the top, you've got a share button. 
and then you have this web mix details right here and that's where you're going to go to make it available and grab the link and that's kind of the quick and dirty on Symbaloo but I, I love that part of it because at the time uh, that was probably one of the best ways to share a collection of bookmarks that was very visual with students. And Josh, the one thing also a fantastic replacement for um, what they used to call I know technology moves fast I Google no uh, what was that personal Google page? Yes, I believe it was. Was it I, now I cannot remember it. <laughs> um, something it was something like I Google. I, I remember that page. I cannot quite remember exactly the name of it, but yeah, that one and kids would always have the little gadgets up there of the gecko they would feed or turtle yes. or something. <laughs> Now, you also notice that on these Simbaloo boards, you can take that entire board and embed that onto a site. Can you show us how to do that, Josh? Yep, absolutely. It's right up in the share button here. Um, and as I go down the steps here, one thing I do want to point out is this, update web mix. If you go on here and you add sites to this and you have it shared or embedded somewhere, the people you share it with actually won't see any updates until you click update web mix. And that's what's going to update it for everybody else that it's shared with. Um, then right down here, you can get an embed code, and just like with any other embed code, you copy and put that into a website. Now, I know with Google Sites, at least it was this way, and I can certainly try and quickly throw together a test right now. Um, it used to be that you have to do the little shield thing in the top right in order to make it work, um, where it won't load the screen right away. So let me... Make a new page here, quick. We'll test and see if that's still the case. But it used to be that if you embed it on a Google site, it doesn't it doesn't show up right away. You have to allow the unsafe script to come through. So we're about to see. Here's the great test. And oh, it does show up right away. I am getting this shield, but it is showing up for me. So that's that's positive. It didn't the last time. I like the fact that it's very, very clean and very, very visual and very, very user friendly. Absolutely. I think that's some of the basic criteria we need for the tools that we employ. Absolutely. One of the features that I like doing is archiving and curating videos. And I'm going to share with you here. Again, all of our shows here are archived over at teachercast.net slash YouTube. And many people don't realize that they can take any video that's up on YouTube and create a playlist from it. Not only that, but they can search other people's playlists. So here we have our TeacherCast um, channel. And on here we have various playlists. For instance, I have a playlist of all of our TeacherCast.tv things. We have all of our teacher, uh, all of our Tech Educator podcasts. We have all of our TeacherCast podcasts. And on the left here, when you're logged into your own site, you have all of the playlists that you are um, that you have created, but I certainly like searching other ones. Here's my second favorite YouTube channel. This happens to be the Sam Patterson channel, and not only does Sam have some great screencasts that he's doing, but he noticed that he's putting all of his playlists up on top for you to check out. So if I want to check out the Waka 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 channel, I've got all of these great videos of Waka here and. Uh, Sam, do you find these playlists are are helpful, or are you just using this to keep your own stuff organized? Uh, the playlists are really helpful. I started using playlists because I wanted to figure them out for classroom use, and now I'm helping teachers at my site create unlisted playlists. So, it, for example, when we upload student videos to YouTube, we do it on an unlisted channel, and my teachers now will use an unlisted playlist to collect all of the unlisted videos and share those with parents. So it's a great way to collect content in a way that puts it all in the same place and that content doesn't even have to be findable by anyone else. Uh, so that's a great option in a school. We can use an unlisted YouTube channel and create unlisted videos and then create unlisted playlists so anyone with that link can view it, but nobody can really find that link unless you send it to them. Well, let's just take a look at some of your options here, Sam. I mean, you have the ability to play all, which means it gives you a video box with all of these in here. Or when you click on share, of course, you can share this out to Facebook and Twitter and Google and all these places. You can embed the entire playlist 
or if I wanted to, I can email this playlist out, and then that person gets all 15 videos. I know this is what I started doing with the school videos that I'm using because I'm creating videos by chapter, and each chapter has certain uh, technology skills that I need the kids to use. So I'm making a bunch of screencasts for chapter one's project, and that becomes a, a YouTube playlist. It's free, it's easy, it's simple to do, and then I have that playlist for whatever reason. If I needed to ever change that playlist, I'll show you how I go in here and do all that. I can just come up here and click on the Creator Studio. And I'm going to click on Video Manager, I believe it is. And then I'm going to go into Playlists. And then let's just click on this 2014 NJEA convention. Oh, there's Chris right there. And if I wanted to, I can take these and I can rearrange them and I can reorder them and I can have them in any order for this playlist that I want. If, for instance, say this video here I needed to get rid of. So it doesn't automatically delete the video once you delete it. But I can certainly say that I want to remove this from the playlist. And so... That's that. Another good thing about the playlist is that if you are watching live right now, te uh, TeacherCast.tv, and let me bring up that page right here, our TeacherCast.tv page, this video box right here is actually a YouTube playlist. And I do it this way on our site, so that way every week when I create a new video box for our, you know, for our weekly show, I don't have to go into the website and recode something. It automatically just gets updated because over here I'm using the teachercast.tv playlist. And you can see here I've got a few things that I need to uh, do some housekeeping on. We will certainly take care of all those. But, um, but yeah, th it's a really neat way to keep a placeholder. I use it for my web development all the time. And, you know, definitely try. There's a lot more to YouTube playlists than uh, that meets the eye here. Excellent. Sounds like a future a entire episode. I, I think we should here. That's a great idea to use that playlist to embed the weekly video. I mean, you just said it right there. You don't have to go in and physically change that. So that saves you so much time over the course of you know doing this every week well we do we do that at school um you know i i, I help out with our youtube channel and, and on our front page of our school district website we have the district page and then we have the individual schools pages and we used to have a system set up where if i wanted a video change i'd have to upload the video meditate on the video email the web person have her change the code send her the it was a mess so i finally just said look i will give you the embed code for a playlist and we can update that any time that we need to without having to, you know, go through a whole bunch of red tape. It's pretty, pretty interesting. Um, Sam, I know you're keeping track over there. How many tools are we up to? Is it 40 or 50 yet? We we're actually at, I believe, uh, 12. Nice. Let's keep going on here. Jeff, one of our topics that we like to talk about is if this, then that. Uh, you've got a couple uh, good options here for how to use that for curation. If this, then that, yeah. If this, then that is really a great tool. And what's really cool is I think the majority of the things that we've talked about tonight are all triggers that can be utilized in if this, then that. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that um, you can see what I'm talking about. And while I'm setting that up, if this, then that is a tool that allows you to um, utilize the information that is in one of your streams, let's call it. And a stream could be anything... But, you know, it could be a Twitter feed, it could be YouTube, it could be your Nest thermostat, it could be a ton of different things that are all triggers on, uh, on if this, then that. And let me show you what I mean by that. Um, I'm going to show you the create a recipe part. It's all built under the premise that you can say if something, then do something else. And that's where the if this, then that comes from. It's really easy to set up. You click the this part. And it gives you a bunch of different triggers that you can choose from. And these are the most popular ones. You'll see things like buffer. You'll see a lot of Android, um, you know, Android location, Android phone call. You can see things like um, Digo we've talked about, Dropbox, email, just a feed, a plain old RSS feed, Feedly. You know, the major players are all listed on if this, then that. And these are all triggers so that if you have information that matches a certain criteria in one of these tools, you can then 
force that information to do something else. And if this, then that is the tool in which you can do it with. Um, so for instance, I'm going to show you uh, a couple of my recipes. This is an account that I don't use all the time. It's kind of a one that I've thrown together just so that you can see what I'm talking about here. Um, so for instance, the one that I use the most is Twitter to Evernote. I, I don't know if anyone else like you are, are like me, but when I favorite a tweet in Twitter, it is essentially worthless to me because I just... I can't get to all of the favorites. You know, you've been on Twitter for years and you've favorited a bunch of stuff that's relevant to you, but getting back to that favorite favorited tweet from maybe six months ago is really not the easiest thing in the world. Also, what I want to be able to do is get to the tweet where I get to all of my other archived information, and that is in Evernote. And so you can see here that um, I have created a if this and that recipe. It says if Twitter, then Evernote. And so for this instance, I have it even dialed down a little bit further. So it says if a new tweet searched for on Twitter matches hashtag tech educator, then append it to a note in my notebook in Evernote. This is a really cool way for me to be able to archive and be able to search through all the people, all the tweets that are being made to the show's hashtag tech educator. And if so, we have that up here. Every time that that runs, it's pumping a note into uh, my tech educator Evernote account. And you can just see they're all nicely organized and they just add one after another. And there's links back to it on Twitter. And it's just really easy to navigate and maintain. And this is all happening without any interaction on my part. So all of our tech educator tweets are all being archived and are really easily accessible by date, all through Evernote search. So um, if you search your Evernote for Craig Yed, it's all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And then additionally, like I was talking about with my favorited tweets, I've set up an if this, then that for um, creating a new Evernote note every time I favorite a tweet. And the reason I did it by every, because there's two different options with Evernote. You can append to a note or you can create a new note. I created a new note for every tweet I favorite because then what Sam was talking about earlier, you want to be able to archive it in a way that it's easily accessible to you. And by creating a new note, I can tag that note with relevant pieces from that tweet. And that way I can easily get back to that content in the future. If, for instance, I, if it's about a fifth grade classroom, I can go to the tag fifth grade and I can have that tweet that's readily available to me. Um, so just so that people can get a better understanding, I'm going to create one of these over again so that people can see the whole process and how easy it is. Uh, when you log in, you're going to click Create a Recipe. You're going to have to tie your Twitter account or whatever account that it is you're going to use to if this, then that, and that's just a simple authentication uh, protocol. But go ahead and click the this part. It step by step takes you through it. We're going to go down and find Twitter. And it's alphabetized, so you click Twitter. And it gives you a list of different triggers. So you can have any time that you tweet something, a this will trigger. You can have it be so that any time you have a new follower, there's a trigger. Um, and that's you know important if you feel like it's important to acknowledge the people that are following you. Uh, you can have it text you every time you have a new follower. Or you can have it email you. Or you can have it automatically respond to that new follower. Hey, thanks for the follow. Um, but what I use it for the most is managing my favorite favorited tweets. So there's an option down here, new favorite tweet by you. You can click that. There's nothing to configure in this part, so you're going to go ahead and go to the create trigger part. So you see now that it's if new favorite tweet by me, then that. And now you're configuring the that part. That part, I want to. I just want to show you how to do it to the Evernote piece, so I'm going to click on Evernote. And then you have your options here. You can create it as a new note. You can append it to a note. You can append a to-do to a note, and I'll show you that in just a minute. Um, you can create an image note from a URL. I mean, there's lots of different options. I'm just going to do a create a new note. 
And then you can see you can um, modify what the title will be as it comes in, the body of the message should you want to, you know, add anything additional to each of those tweets when they come into Evernote. And you can also specify which notebook it's going into in your Evernote account. If you want a specific tag, you can tag it automatically and all the tweets that are coming in with that, um, with this trigger will come in tagged automatically. So for instance, on my tech educator one, I have it all being tagged tech educator automatically. Um, and that's it. You can create the action and it's done. So, I mean, it's really simple to do this uh, and have it, it runs, I think, every 10 or so minutes um, and it automatically files everything into Evernote. The one that's really, any questions about that? I have another quick thing and then I know we probably want to move on to something else. Awesome. Um, the really cool one about the to-do list in Evernote, so for instance, Jeff, you were talking about uh, creating a watch later playlist or creating playlists in YouTube. And for videos that I don't have the time to watch right now, I will mark them watch later. But I also want them to be with all of my other information in Evernote. And so I've created a YouTube um, watch later trigger. So if I click watch later in YouTube, then it's gonna automatically append that video to a specific note as a to-do item. And why that's important to me is, as you can see in my Evernote, I've, I just created this one for this episode, but you can see here that when I created it, there's a link to the video, and it's also marked as a to-do. So as I watch these videos, I can mark them as watched, and I remember what I've watched and what I haven't from that list. So it just kind of centralizes all of my data, and I know that I can go into Evernote and have information from Twitter and uh, YouTube and you know, all the other places where you saw those triggers, they can all feed into Evernote as well. There's a lot of neat things that you can do with Evernote, isn't it, Jeff? There's a ton of th neat things you can do with Evernote and a ton of things that you can do with, uh, with if this, then that. Like, for instance, t Twitter can go into Google Drive, too. If, you've, if you're more of a Drive user, uh, all of your favorite tweets can go into a spreadsheet in Google Drive as well. Excellent. And uh, we are starting to wrap up here. We have a few more curation tools, but I did want to get a hold of something that was bringing up on the chat up here. Uh, Craig, I saw, actually asked, how do I curate all of the babies and how do I keep them all in line? And Craig, I don't know if you saw this earlier, but we actually have the TeacherCast 3000 here. And this is the security system that we have in place for the babies. Now we can put all of them in one video camera system and we can take a look at them anytime that we need to. So definitely check out those things at your local Babies R Us. There's also some great stuff happening over here on the chat room asking about Twitter. Um, Chris Nessie, how do you uh, find curating Twitter? How do you do all that stuff? Well, curating Twitter can be a daunting task, but I think one of the great things about Twitter and really everything we've all been sharing tonight here on Tech Educator is the fact that all of these tools, they, they don't work independently of each other, but you can really make them all talk to each other. And with what Mr. Herb just shared with, you know, if this, then that, that really, 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 really automates the process. So if you're using Twitter, if you're using something like Buffer to kind of automate sending your tweets out, or if you're a big Evernote user, Google Docs, or any of those channels, as, as Jeff showed in his demonstration, make them all talk to each other. And the less you have to interact with the tools, it, it, it can really help you out. I don't know what, what your thoughts are on that, everybody. I think the more you automate your curation, the easier it's going to be for you to collect tools because we all have ways that we interact with our social media. And having that actually be something and mean something, you know, is a real game changer because otherwise the favorite button in Twitter might mean I really like this or it might mean I want to try to find this later in my favorite feeds or it might mean, oops, I clicked a little bit to the right of the retweet button. Um, you know, we were just talking in the chat room about how great it would be if the plus wanting something in Google Plus actually moved that, you know, if there was an if this and that trigger for that. So in the grand tradition of the Tech Educator podcast, I'm going to put this out there. At some point in the near future, I think Google Plus is going to have that kind of integration. <laughs> and if our record holds true, it'll happen within the week. 
Absolutely, Sam. That is a good point. We do have a stellar record of somebody at Google listening in on these broadcasts and then saying, huh, those guys know what they're talking about. That's right. But the other tool that I wanted to share was TweetDeck. And you guys let me know, does this warrant a screen share or can we just kind of talk about TweetDeck? Let's just talk through it. Okay, let, let, let's talk TweetDeck. TweetDeck is basically, it used to be independent of Twitter and now Twitter owns it. And it allows you to either on your desktop or in your browser, basically manage and run a Twitter account or multiple Twitter accounts. And what that allows you to do is you can have your main stream for everybody that you follow. And you also have the ability to set up basically columns. And what columns allow you to do is basically sort it all out. You can have a column for your main stream, you can have a column for new followers, mentions, people who retweet you, a favorites column. And it really allows you to better manage Twitter than just using Twitter.com. How many of you guys use TweetDeck? Me. I use it. I do. Does anybody use, or what's the other one, Hootsuite? I used to. I moved to TweetDeck from Hootsuite. Does anybody have more than seven Twitter IDs going in their TweetDeck? Yes. Seven I, IDs? What? I, I'm I'm sorry, I do. But that that's because many of them are Ed Camps. Ah, uh, oh. Ed Camps. Herb, what gets you above seven? Uh <laughs> affiliate marketing. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> My mine are all puppets, but whatever. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> so so tweet deck is valuable. And again, when, when you combine that with the power of something like IFTTT, I hope that was enough T's and not too many, um, you know, curation becomes very easy. And then what's the whole point of curation? To share, to collect information for yourself. And then, like, like we said at the beginning of the show, you know, push what is valuable to other people. And really, that's what it's all about, I think. Yeah, I think I couldn't agree with you more. I have a... Uh... A Twitter list of all of the participants of the Google Teacher Academy this past summer in Mountain View. So I will always see in one column, anybody who's in that list, I'll see their tweets. So it's really easy to keep up to date and on track with what um, all of my friends and um, cohort members are up to. And that's valuable because otherwise you might miss it amongst you know thousands of people that you may follow. So it's a management tool, not just curating. Yeah, and think about Twitter chats. I mean, I, I know I participate in my fair share of Twitter chats, and without TweetDeck, it's really not easy to participate in that. Um, with Twitter, you can search the hashtag, and you can keep track of it that way. But with TweetDeck, it auto-loads the responses, so you don't have to keep clicking on more to see what the next people had to say. I will say, not, not to go off on a tangent, but I know we have some time tonight. When I do Twitter chats, I, I use TweetDeck in combination with TweetChat.com. Are you, oh, guys familiar, are you guys familiar with TweetChat? Tweet chat? Oh, I've yeah, heard of Tweet that. Yeah, TweetChat's a good, good site. Yeah, I use that most. I use that either either TweetChat.com or TChat.io. I actually have had some better luck with TChat.io recently. It's got been a little bit more smooth. Um, sometimes TweetChat can get a little backlog. So, um, does that work yeah, under the same chat? Yeah, same exact thing. Uh, I just feel like they have a little bit better handle on their system. So, and then if both are good. Now. Dual monitors, it's even better. <laughs> there you go, man. There you go. So there's a few other great uh, curation tools that we want to hit. Say hello, my honey. Um, somebody here in the chat mentioned Digo, which is one that I'm not too familiar with. Uh, Josh, are you familiar with Digo? I am familiar with Digo. Uh, I'm a fan. I do use it every once in a while. I certainly don't take advantage of it as much as I can. There's a couple things I want to highlight quick with it. So just to do the super quick method here, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. All right. So I don't know how much of this is going to show up. I'm going to quick find an article really quick um, just to try and show some of the features of Digo. Um, so Digo is a bookmarking tool, but it goes a step further. Uh, let's see here. Tony Romo won a game. How about that? He's a Wisconsin boy. Woo. Um, anyways. So Digo is a bookmarking tool, but it's also an annotation tool. 
So I have my Digo page open. I'm logged in. And everything you do comes into a list. And you can tag it like so many of the other tools. You know, I don't need to go too much into that. And you can search the tags. Um, but the really two cool features I want to mention. First one is uh, the highlighting feature. So earlier I was looking up an article on ESPN about college football. And with the Digo extension, which I think I'm not going to be able to really show because there are some limitations in um, the Hangout, right? So I just clicked on the Digo extension. Can you see the drop down? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it shows up when I click on it. Uh, so there is a little extension, and you get a drop down when you click on it. And if you're on a website with text, you get a few different options. You have this annotate option. You can screenshot. You can share the page. Um, I'm going to go ahead and click on annotate, and that gives me a few tools. I can highlight. I can put a post-it note, and then I can just save it. So I really like the highlighting feature because if I'm researching, this is especially great for students. A lot of times, there's only part of an article or a website that's really applicable to what they want, like the key points. So instead of having to bookmark the site and go back out there and read through the whole thing, they can find the sentence here or paragraph. Let's see, here's about Romo and his injury. I'm going to highlight that. And then two things happen. When I highlight it, I actually get some tools that drop down, which you probably still can't see. Um, so I get a little highlighter, a commenter, and a magnifying glass. So I can go ahead and highlight that, and I can make it pink. Does everybody see that it's pink now? Yep. So yes. the cool part now, what happens is back over in Digo, now that I did that, here it is. Here's that entry that I just bookmarked, and there's my highlight. And notice the pink light on the left side here? That actually would mean if I highlight something in yellow, then I would get another another section down here. So if I highlight this and I decide to make it yellow, and I go back to Digo, I think I was a little too fast in the trigger there. <laughs> I'm, I'm moving faster than the speed of Digo. Um, you'll, get, you'll get a second section here for that, which, which will be good. Um, that's cool. Possibly. Um, but anyway, so that's really cool for getting things together. Now, the other thing that's really cool is this. I'm going to scroll down just slightly, and you'll notice I have a batch of tweets here, and it all says about 21 hours ago. Well, I can tell you this. I was not on Digo 21 hours ago. What I was on is a day's worth of favorites on Twitter. So this is another place where you can actually store your favorites on Twitter, and it stores the tweet and the link to the tweet and any links that were within the tweet there. So I'm cool. going to go ahead and... I'm going to show you how I got that set up. Um, it used to be, I think I had this as an educator account. Honestly, I set this up so long ago I don't quite remember. Uh, but if I go into my account up here and go into Tools, uh, there's a bunch of different services for Digo. At the bottom, you have Save Favorite Tweets. Now, there's some limitations on the free accounts. I'm not sure what they are, but I can tell you I haven't hit them. Um, usually, it... Here's what it says. The system only automatically saves your latest tweets, uh, which is kind of like the if this, then that recipe, where it will only save what you tweet after you set it up. So it won't right. grab your favorites. But if you had a premium account, it would actually grab all of your favorites. So that's kind of cool. Uh, so that's going to be kind of my quick Digo method there. Some people that use this pretty religiously, you can share the bookmarks and have shared collections of bookmarks together. Uh, it's actually a pretty cool feature. And there's an educator account that you can actually set up student accounts underneath uh, your account for curating resources. Vicky in the chat was just mentioning that, that you can set up students on Digo and have groups for sharing links. So when you're working with students on research and teaching students how to curate, because really, web curation isn't something that teachers are just doing for themselves. We're trying to pass those skills on to students so they can be informed and organized users of the internet. So Digo allows you to do that. Very cool. Well, we certainly have gone through a lot 
of online curation tools. If you have one that you like that maybe we didn't hit, please check us out. You can find us on our website over at teachercast.net. And you can, of course, go over into our section under techeducatorpodcast.com. This is episode number 74. And all of our links are going to be up there under the techeducatorpodcast.com. Before we get out of here, I want to say a couple things. First of all, we had a special occasion on Friday. Did you know that Friday was a very special day for us here at TeacherCast? Friday. Why was Friday such a special day for you at TeacherCast? Because Jeff? Friday <laughs> was the first birthday for the Edu Triplets. All Woo! right. One birthday, whole baby. year old. And they're doing fantastic. Sarah now is about 18, 19 pounds or so, and she's doing wonderful. And Robert is now crawling up and down the rugs and getting caught into different things. And Christopher is still in the hospital, but he's doing really, really well. And everybody there absolutely adores him. They call him the cute one. So want to say thank you out there for anybody who's watching, listening, and all those great things. I saw a lot of tweets over to the at Edu Triplets account saying uh, – saying happy birthday to them. And it was really, really cool, Chris, on uh, Thursday when you and I were broadcasting and uh, my wife brought the babies over and watching them crawl around. It was kind of cool. So want to say thank you to everybody who was out there doing that stuff. They are amazing little guys, and, and I love them so much. Say hello! <laughs> <laughs> Can I share what their highlight may have been from the conference? Uh-oh, yes. They got to meet the cat in the hat. They certainly did meet the cat in the hat. We've got a good picture of them meeting the cat in the hat. So, yeah, good stuff there. Next week, please stick with us. Uh, next week, we're going to actually have a great company on called Cresherance, which is an app development company, and they're doing some great things for school districts who are looking for apps, but they also got a neat little system for students that want to make apps. So how many of you guys next week are interested in learning about apps? I know your hands are up, Sarah. Your hand is up, but you're trying to grab at microphones. So please join us next week. And if you're out there, let your friends know. We're talking all about apps and app development. This is part of our um, preview of the Hour of Code. Sam, tell us a little bit more about what's going on with the Hour of Code. When is it? How do we get involved with it? Who do we talk to? Hour of Code is sponsored by Code.org. They are currently in the midst of the fastest running Kickstarter, I think it's Kickstarter, or is it Indiegogo? Ugh, blew that one. Campaign, uh, they're crowdsourced fundraising $5 million to bring coding education to 10 million students, and they're over halfway to their goal. Um, from the December 8th to December 14th is the Hour of Code week. During that time, they're trying to get teachers all over the world, especially in the U.S., to teach one hour of computer programming. And they have all kinds of great resources on their website, code.org forward slash learn. And there are many companies that have put together special apps and web-based versions of their apps to make coding accessible to teachers with just about any tech configuration, including some who have put together completely offline paper-based coding activities. So if you're saying to yourself, well, I can't teach programming because I don't have computers, you'd be surprised at all the opportunities that are out there for you. So check this out. Next week, we're going to be here live again. There's no 30-second take podcast tonight. Uh, Brad is going to be coming back with all of his coding strength next week for episode. I think he's on number 17 or 18. So definitely check that out. Find us online at Tech Ed Show. You can follow me at TeacherCast. Sam, what's your Twitter account? At S-A-M-P-A-T-U-E. Nessie, Twitter account. Mr. Nessie, M-R-N-E-S-I. Come on, do it in song. M R N E S I M R. All right, Jeff Herb, Twitter account. At I N S T Tech Talk. Josh. At Mr. G Fact of the Day. Nice. On behalf of everybody here at the TeacherCast Network, thank you so much for checking us out. We will be back live next week and continue following us here at TeacherCast. <laughs>